can then go on to subspecialize um, and one of those subspecialties is uh, working in pre-hospital care um, which I'd done for quite a while on a voluntary basis um, before then taking a year out of training um, to then fly full-time for a year kind of getting a, a wealth of experience with the with the charity. Brilliant. Um, can you describe what equipment you carry inside the helicopter? Uh, yeah, so we carry, so whenever we, we go to scene, we have um, two bags basically that are full of most of our equipment, um, which contain uh, drugs. We have an ultrasound machine. We have a kind of blood gas machine so we can do blood tests um, at the patient side. Uh, it has fluids, um, oxygen masks, whole, whole heap of kit just within those bags and then a monitor that goes alongside them. So we take them generally to every single patient. Um, and then we have some extra kit that we probably don't need on every job, but have it available to us. So that would be um, a ventilator for people that we do pop off to sleep. Uh, we now carry blood on board the helicopter. We carry some more specialized um, surgical equipment. So we can do some surgical procedures um, kind of in, in the pre-hospital environment without needing a patient to go to theater. Um, we carry different um, splints, so if someone's got a you know, nasty um, broken arm or leg, um, we can kind of just sedate the patient so they're not really aware of what's going on and then pull those limbs straight and put them in something that's similar to a plaster cast um, yeah, on the side of the road. We carry um, blood on board to the aircraft or blood products now, so patients that have been bleeding quite significantly, um, we can then... Um, as, as well as giving them fluid, we can give them blood products to try and stabilise them as well before getting them to hospital. So um, there's quite a, quite a bit of kit on board. We kind of say it's it's almost like bringing the intensive care to the roadside, um, the, the amount of kit that we carry. Brilliant. Um, just to let everyone know, um, I forgot the two bits. I forgot to record this, the first two words I asked no you to. Um, so obviously we'll do that at the end. But anyone, no worries. And anyone that has, anyone that misses it, don't worry. It will be um, played um, throughout the show, as I've told Georgina and Nicola. Um, so yeah. we'll just go through it again at the at the end. No, I do apologise for not recording. I just forgot to hit record. So, That's all right. No worries. Oh. Uh, what do you think of the new Norwich base? Um, I love it. So we basically we have two aircraft. We have an aircraft in Norwich and then we have one in Cambridge. So Norwich has always kind of been what I call my home base where I've done most of my flying from. Um, so I'm very used to kind of our old setup, uh, which was in a much it's on the same site, but in a much smaller hangar with with less facilities. Uh, whereas it's now obviously much it's a much bigger hangar. Um, it means that all of the as well as the clinical staff, we have all of the charity staff on site. Um, it's really kitted out to kind of consider our needs on shift um, and between shifts. So we do 12 hour days, they're long days, and we may do a run of three or four shifts. Um, and if we're kind of traveling um, a distance from home, it means that we can stay overnight. So we've got, you know, kind of mod con facilities, we've got kind of kitchen rest area, we've got a gym, um, places where you can kind of have downtime, basically, um, particularly if some of the jobs that we go to are quite stressful, it's it's a good way to take your mind off things. And then we've got um, kind of state of the art training facilities as well um, that we can we can simulate different jobs. We've got all of our medical kit on site as well. So it's just lovely being under one roof with with both the charity staff and the clinical staff as as one big team to kind of um continue the operation from um particularly now because uh within it's actually within the next couple of weeks um so we have a doctor and a paramedic on 24 7 um but at the moment the helicopter doesn't fly all night but as of the 30th of june the aircraft will be coming online um 24 hours a day as well which obviously means overnight we can then cover f further distances quicker. Um, we can we can get to certain places obviously in the car, but having the aircraft on board all night long will mean that we can cover a, a wider patch of East Anglia, not just within Norfolk, um, 
by air as well as car so being able to have such a good facility um to be to be based from is is absolutely amazing so you said that they, that you're flying out from the 17th was that yesterday that they went you were doing 24th? No, no, so from the no from the 30th sorry all oh, right okay okay seven yeah a couple of weeks time um yeah. so georgina told me about the uh, pods in the uh new base she she asked me yeah. to ask you how 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 they are what they're like yeah um so i don't know if you've seen pictures of them at all but to describe them they are i suppose similar if anyone's familiar with the the concept has kind of come out from uh from japan predominantly actually that they have these small little sleeping pods that rather than having a whole hotel room you literally it's almost like a little cocoon um you know pod basically ours are a little bit more of a luxury than that so um as long as you've not got claustrophobia they're fine um, but once you're in them and the lights are out they've got nice padded mattresses they've got lights they've got internet in them uh they've got a fan so you can temperature control um and you basically kind of shut your blind you you wiggle yourself in you shut your blind at the at the end of the beds and you wouldn't know that you you weren't in a bedroom to be fair um but they're they're right next to where our little operational base is um so it means that on a night shift um you can get your head down between jobs if um if there's not as much going on so we, we do a full night shift 7 7 p.m until 7 a.m um where we are um immediately available to respond but it means actually um kind of as your as your body kind of has dipped and you're feeling a bit tired you can just nip into one for a bit of a nap if you need to to make sure that as and when the phone goes you you're good to go and refreshed and safe to to go immediately i know this is not a question but obviously a lot of people will ask um obviously you're a doctor how would yeah how would you explain to people how to become a doctor because obviously some people may want to become a doctor uh yeah no it's absolutely it's, it's a fair question it's not a problem at all so um if i kind of say so my career path was really so at school um i was really into doing science kind of biology so that's what got my interest in the first place so um did well in that and gcse's um and then you obviously move on to doing your A-levels. And I would say probably one of the tips before you even start doing your A-levels and you start looking at what subjects to potentially do, already at that point, start having a look at different medical schools because different medical schools will have different um, criteria, essential criteria and different subjects that they want you to do. It always historically actually meant that you needed to do chemistry as an A-level. You'd think biology was more important, but but frequently it's actually um, chemistry that they like you to have. Um, and obviously academically, you do have to be um, getting the highest grades possible. Um, it may now be at A-level actually that they want you to have three A grades at A-level. So it's a lot of hard work that you have to put in. However, it's it's not just the academic side of things that you need to show. You need to show some commitment to the specialty and interest in um, in in medicine, but in caring as well. So obviously, not every some some people like to do and try and get work experience within a doctor's surgery or within the hospital. That's not necessarily. Um, valued more above actually than demonstrating that you're um, a caring person that you have great communication skills so as long as you can kind of link back into um, helping so some people that it was literally as much as working on um, a checkout in Tesco's or but you could link that into you did some time in um, customer services and supporting um you, you know, shoppers with issues, resolving issues, being able to de-escalate the, the angry shopper that, uh, you know, something has gone wrong with whatever they produce that they've bought. Um, showing that empathetic side um, is really important. Then it's things like keeping uh, up to date with anything medical in the news. Obviously, we can't kind of get around COVID at the moment, but other medical uh, research or interventions, new treatments that are available, and and that's anything in um, 
you know, it's, it's as simple as kind of being on the BBC website. All of that side of things may be discussed. Um, so once you've submitted your application form, um, if you then get an offer of invitation to go and see a medical school, um, that's the kind of thing that may come up in an interview. Um, and it's it's just being friendly, approachable, personable at interview. And you go from there, basically. Um, and then it's it's five or six years at medical school um, with a lot more exams, um, a lot more theory, academic work, and then um, placements in hospital covering all manner of specialties um, before you get your final exams and, and signed off six years later to start start becoming a doctor and then it's another eight to ten years to to become a consultant after that so it is not it is not an easy career to pick but it's a massively worthwhile and rewarding career I would say that I've had that's a very long explanation but I hope it makes sense yeah um I've had some other questions come in people are asking yeah. about how the donations get used um yeah so um anybody that um donates it's all kind of worked out by our um looked after by our fundraising team um and we we have kind of uh budgets um that we we basically work out what equipment we need um, and what staffing we need so the the charity is completely reliant on donations we don't have any government funding we're not funded by the nhs at all um the average we think kind of calculating it out the average mission costs about three and a half thousand pounds so every time we go to scene to see a patient um in terms of getting the aircraft um and that comes with so it's two pilots um a doctor and a critical care paramedic so we're always at least a team of four sometimes there's a second doctor on board providing supervision to one of our registrars um getting to scene, providing patient care, all of that equipment that I spoke of earlier um, is obviously kind of super specialized equipment. So it's, um, you know, that that's what some of the, the donations go towards paying for the equipment, for drugs, um, for, for ongoing training needs. Um, it all, it, you know, it, it adds up, it's, it's expensive, but it's what we need to be able to provide the best patient care. Um, so another question has come in. Um, obviously, yeah. um, how can other people like donate? Obviously, the Just Given page I'll go go in. Obviously, m m people may want to do events. Obviously, like try and raise money for you lot for the Eastern Air Ramblers. Yeah. So what so, would, what would you suggest towards people? Um, so the the easiest thing is to probably go to the. Um, East of England Air Ambulance website has most of the information, um, information on getting involved. Um, at the moment, uh, June is get up and go month. So we've had lots of different events going on um, from baking, releasing balloons, then our kind of Trek 24 seven um, events are already being um, arranged. But the um, fundraising team can then get in contact with individuals if you'd like to and arrange uh, an event yourselves to give you guidance on how to do that, to help um, supply kind of um, donation pots, to give you posters, information, leaflets, um, anything that can kind of go alongside whatever kind of event um, that you'd like to do. The more weird and wonderful, the better, whether it's you know, some people that are like holding like bake sales, but equally, you know, jumping out of aeroplanes or doing, honestly, the, the creativity of members of the public astounds me sometimes as to what, what people do. But yeah, the best thing I think I would do would be to direct you to the, to the website and the fundraising team um, who've got all of their contact details there. So we'll be able to, to help talk through how, how it works, organizing an event um, and then donating to the charity another question is just coming on twitch um obviously yeah. you said that obviously your one isn't funded by the government or the nhs um yeah um someone i know has just put are all air ambulances charity funded or are the others funded by the nhs no so all air ambulance charities are exactly that are charities so not one of us um receives any funding from the nhs or from government every everyone is kept going by um public donations yeah 
obviously you're a doctor um obviously yep. um you've got paramedics on board anyone that wants to become a paramedic what would you suggest um so it's uh so it's a you know doctor or paramedic i think you it's it's such a difficult and um a career where you absolutely have to give it your all and be fully dedicated to the role but i think the the first step is is realizing and recognizing how much hard work it is and therefore doing it for the right reasons not being pressured into it by anyone else or maybe you know that might be something that i would be interested in um so it's fully kind of researching and reading around what these different roles involved um i kind of touched on 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 the uh, the role of the kind of the doctor in the career path there but it's similar for paramedics um it's not always the easiest but like i said you can arrange work experience and and shadowing um either paramedic or doctors as they whether that's in the hospital or surgery um talking to kind of friends of friends if you know anybody um but it, it's the key is 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 making that decision that it's absolutely definitely something that you want to pursue it's not for everybody and some people will start entering training and it's only actually when you start doing the job that you may then realize that this isn't what I expected, that this is tougher than I thought, or I, you know, unfortunately you do see some scenes and, and the most unwell patients that, that can be really difficult to deal with and realize it's, it's not for me. Um, but, but yeah, in, in the first instance, really having reading around what the roles involved, obviously the, the internet will give you a wealth of experience. It's not quite the same as, um, talking to individuals, but kind of attending careers fairs. There's, you know, representatives for for the NHS for nursing paramedics that you may be able to get further information from and go from there. Um. So obviously, Georgina uh, spoke to him about obviously um, the uh, charity going back on TV. So hopefully, going to be doing yeah. the charity uh, the TV thing again. Can you have you yeah. have you been on one or have you been chosen? Yeah. What, yeah, I have done. Yeah. Uh, what's your experience on that one? Because of how it worked. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So basically, this summer, so it's just starting again in the next couple of weeks. Um, uh, so the program that we're on is called Emergency Helicopter Medics. Um, we didn't film last year because of COVID, but we did film a couple of years ago. Um, and what's involved is that the aircraft is fitted up with kind of GoPro cameras. Um, we as the clinical team will wear GoPros as well. And then we have a um, cameraman with us. Um, and they'll do some filming around base just trying to I don't know if anyone's seen the programs, but it's just giving people kind of the background as to what our different bases because they film with different charities, what the bases look like, what we get up to on base, whether that's just chilling out getting work done or doing kind of training on shift um and that's running through kind of similar like previous incidents um to, to see how previous incidents went further skills development um and then as and when the phone goes uh basically the cameraman comes with us um so whether that's in the aircraft or whether that's on the car and um, we'll you know go to the job um, and they're they're basically there filming um, and they film everything that happens um, after after the job has finished. They do then go back and seek um, kind of patient or parent consent. So they may there may be scenes or uh, cases that they film at that people don't give consent. And therefore that that footage is then destroyed and isn't used at all. But for those patients that are happy to consent to have their case shown on the television, um, they then uh, go back and edit all of the footage and make it into a storyline. And then they will come back to both us and the patients. And then we go into the studio and do uh, an interview with with the director, with the, uh, the TV company, um, and basically talk through the job. Um, and that's then explaining to everybody clinically what's happened, as well as they will sometimes touch on kind of thoughts and feelings, how we felt going to these jobs, how how difficult they can be. And they kind of 
interweave that with the patient story as well. Um, and when possible, they'll also do interviews with patients. And um, most of the time, at the, at the towards the end of the episode, you'll then see them follow up with the patient and kind of give you the patient outcome, whether that's, you know, how long the, the patient stayed in hospital for and hopefully that they're now back home or what operation they needed to get them better. Um, and it goes from there. But um, it's it's different, but it's it's quite good fun having them with you. You kind of forget that the cameraman's there after a while. It sounds a bit odd when there's this camera in your face, but they do they could kind of melt into the background because you're so focused on the patient that you phase everything else out really. So it's not it's not much of an added stress after you've been doing it for a while. Another question: Have you have you been uh, been more or less busy due to COVID? Um, last year, definitely our numbers were lower, um, and that's that was reflected in our data when we've when we've run run the data. That I think obviously because more people were just staying at home, not out and about. That actually things, you know, our our numbers for car accidents, for like I said, horse riding or kind of motocross, any any kind of um, incidents like that, really really significantly fell um and we're definitely seeing the rebound now as as the country's kind of come out of lockdown and opening up our numbers are are definitely back to normal again so hopefully because you're a doctor you've been working through the pandemic yeah and obviously uh, i work in the uh, security industry and you're gonna put that out there obviously you've been working through the pandemic um yeah what has been challenging for you as a doctor uh so during the pandemic last year I think initially at the start, the biggest challenge that we all had was that COVID was obviously, it was a new virus. We didn't really know what we were facing because we didn't, there wasn't evidence in years and years of experience with dealing it, it you know, it's not the same as just a seasonal flu or any other condition that we are kind of fully informed about. So we didn't really know how it behaved. Initially, we didn't really know how it was spread. We didn't know the best methods of treating it um, because all of that, you know, comes with experience and with time, with clinical trials, trialing one drug or another drug. Um, we didn't have a grasp on how prevalent it was in the community because it took a few months for testing to become um, more widespread. Um, and the NHS had never seen anything like it at all. So I think everyone now understands what the words PPE meant you know a couple of years ago that wasn't it wasn't really a thing so having um going to work and not knowing what you were facing and initially not having the correct PPE for you know whether that's the right kind of masks aprons gloves eye protection not necessarily having that available not knowing who or who might not have COVID um and then initially you know a lot of staff did get sick and you know not an insignificant number of nurses doctors paramedics um and other staff that work with us um got covid and unfortunately you know some of them died as well and and we just didn't understand and so didn't have the data to know actually how how at risk were we? It's so ingrained in us that we want to make a difference and we want to make people better whilst equally trying to protect ourselves as much as possible to protect our loved ones. So a lot of people basically moved out, moved out of their home because they had um, family members that were shielding and already potentially more susceptible. So you're going to work, you've maybe not got all of the kit you need, you don't know what you're facing, you can't even go home to loved ones. Um, that, you know, that initial first three, four months were incredibly challenging. Um, since then, obviously, we've, you know, testing has become a lot better. We've now, we're doing so much better with the vaccination programme. And actually, our PP stocks are, you know, full. It's It's not a problem at all now. And we've seen that in the number of NHS staff, you know, the, the numbers getting COVID is is way is is minuscule now, if if any at all, um, which is obviously a lot more, you know, reassuring, um, kind of comforting now, kind of going through, moving through things. What's your average day um, with working with the uh, EAA AAA? Uh, with the AAA, um, so 
like I said before, so our shifts are 12 hour shifts, either seven in the morning till seven at night or then the night shift seven at night till seven in the morning. Um, the first thing that we do when we come in in the morning is we draw the drugs that we use most commonly throughout the day. So we draw all the drugs up. We check all of our kit. So that's those kind of main bags and monitor that we use. We check everything on the car uh, so that all of the kit is there in case the team the day before have used kit and to make sure that everything has been restocked. So that's both the car and the aircraft. Um, and then we will have um, a morning briefing with our pilots. And that is looking at, um, looks at the weather. Um, so we need to know if it's a good day for flying or not. So there are some conditions in which we're not allowed to fly. Um, and we, we call, kind of call that without out of weather limits. Uh, which means the aircraft's grounded. So we can't fly in things like fl fog or if the cloud base is really low. So we go through, the, through that briefing um, and then we will go through some training after that, both, and some of that's kind of aviation discussing topics that will also affect the clinical team. And then some clinical training. And I said, that's like, it's going through scenarios, simulations, um, especially when there's um, two doctors. So we can have a doctor and a paramedic practicing with a mannequin, we can give our doctors uh, a scenario, say, you know, you've gone to a motorcyclist that's fallen off their bike at high speed, they look like they've got a broken arm, a broken leg, and they're unconscious. How would you treat this patient? And we have at Norwich in the in the new Helimed house, we have um, an in-house simulation centre, which can be a um, um, just makes things a lot more realistic. So you can project up on the wall the um, the scene of a car crash or a, a, a motorcyclist accident, you can make that room 30 degrees, you can make it three degrees, it can get wet, you, we've got a wind machine in it, um, and we've got quite high fidelity equipment so that we can, um, as, as and when the team go to put monitoring on the patient to check their heart rate and their blood pressure, we can um, give them real real time numbers and make their heart go really quick and make their blood pressure go really low to act out true to life scenarios. Um, and so and then we'll kind of debrief those, say what what went well, what didn't go so well, what are the the learning that come from them, what would you do differently next time? Um, and then from there, it's uh, basically waiting for the phone to go. Um, and say whether that's going going by air or going by road, responding to the jobs. We probably on average go to uh, two, it's about two jobs a day. Um, but getting to those jobs, being on scene, managing the patient if they need to go to hospital and then coming back to base and sorting out kit can mean that it takes maybe three hours to do to do a job, three or four hours by the time you've then sorted out kit and drugs and paperwork afterwards. So doing obviously a couple of jobs a day kind of is, is a significant portion of the shift. Um, in, in between time, hopefully there's a little bit of downtime for, for breakfast, lunch and dinner. It doesn't always happen. Sometimes you are literally out all day, um, which, which, which has its pros and cons. You know, it's absolutely what we're there to do. Um, it's our job. And if we can make a difference, we absolutely want to. Um, sometimes it just means that you have to grab a cereal bar on the go rather than being able to sit down and eat your lunch. But it's it's just one part of the job and it's fine. Are they um are they um pilots medically trained? Uh, so they're not they're not medically trained. They're the ones that are there to fly the aircraft. However, um they do know our kit quite well. So if we need extra pairs of hands, particularly if if we're going to really a rural remote locations, we'll often beat the land ambulance there, which means if someone is critically unwell, a third or fourth pair of hands comes in really useful. So they're not technically medically trained, but they can help put um, splints on or they can fetch and carry. They can grab us, you know, more oxygen from the aircraft if we need it. They can put the patient on the scoop and, and load them if we're going to fly the patient. They can help with that kind of kind of stuff. They can hold up bags of fluids if we need to. Um, so yeah, so they you know they they kind of cotton on to what uh, what type of incident we're going to and what kit we might or might not need. 
um, and are definitely very useful. They're probably better at helping me out than I am at flying a helicopter. We'll put it like that, which is a common misconception that people think we fly the aircraft as well. And we that wouldn't end up well with a doctor and a paramedic doing that. We need our pilots for that. We definitely need our pilots for that bit. Um, obviously, Georgina said about the uh, virtual room and the um, yeah. thingy. Uh, do you want to go over that? Because hopefully um, do you, there's some stuff about that as well that she said. Yeah, so that's our what we've got our kind of simulation suites, our fully immersive suite. Um, and so basically what it is, it's a, it's a room with um, projectors and then um, like CCTV cameras on the ceiling um, that you can control from a control room um, with all of the computer settings. Um, and what we and the company have done previously that have supplied this equipment to us is they've basically gone to different scenes. Sometimes that's as much as standing um, in a city centre with a 360 degree camera, just filming people walking past, because sometimes that's the kind of place that we will go. If someone's collapsed in the middle of a city centre, then it just adds that degree of reality that you know, whilst we're sitting or they're working on a patient, um, there's people standing around watching and staring at you and there's noise and shouting and music or whatever playing in the background. Um, and like I said, we can make it so it's 30 degrees in that room, kind of like the weather we had earlier in the week. I know it's changed a bit now. So that it is, it adds a another component of realism, or we can make it freezing cold and the room goes down to three degrees. There's fans in the ceiling, so we can make it really blowy and windy. Um, we can then do the simulation, um, kind of play it forwards, um, treat the patient. And then actually it means with all of the cameras, someone from the control room can control those cameras, can zoom in on um, different different parts so whether that's focusing on the doctor or the paramedic and then we can replay the scene afterwards which helps with the debrief discussing what went well what didn't go well um, and reviewing footage as to why something maybe didn't go well so that we can then explore that further discuss it learn from it so that in the future doing a similar type of simulation or actually going to that as a job um, we can we can you know kind of hone our skills and deliver the best care possible um but we can within the um sim suite as well the same as that we do with the filming um we've got gopro cameras so actually it means in heli med house we could take a mannequin and take it upstairs and put it in the kitchen um and and film the team treating the patient um you know else elsewhere in the building um and making it a bit more realistic as well um to, to yeah try and embed basically just so it's not so kind of stark kind of fake environment it means you can get fully immersed in what the sim is um trying to make it as true to life as possible basically so obviously you've got the aftercare team yeah and the uh EAAA. um can you just tell us a bit about that uh yeah so we have a team of um, nurses uh, uh, make up our aftercare team um, and what we found um, previously is that the, the type of patients that we treat are the sickest and most unwell patients that we at the time address their kind of physical needs getting them stabilized and getting them to hospital the patients then are obviously treated in hospital for those conditions, but what is not necessarily addressed quite so much is the psychological burden that that patient undergoes, um, the, the stress, the post-traumatic stress um, of what they've been through, some of which people may remember, some won't remember because we've put them off to sleep at the side of the road. And it helps that healing process, not only say the physical, but from, from a mental side of things, welfare, that our aftercare team will get involved, will follow these patients up. Um, and what it means that they can do is spend time with these patients. They can then, once all of the, the, the medical side of stuff is addressed, they can sit with the patients they can talk them through the timeline of what happened to be able to allow patients to process what it is that they've gone through why they're feeling what they're feeling 
Um, and quite frequently, hopefully, it, again, it hasn't happened with COVID, but it means that the aftercare team can then um, eventually bring these patients back to um, our base for base visits with the crew that treated them. I think we find that by explaining everything that has happened to the patients and meeting the crew, we can fill in those gaps in their memory where they've been so poorly they can't recall things. Um, and giving them that ongoing support to know that, you know, actually they're not alone. They're not the only person that feels like this. It's very common after such a significant trauma to uh, kind of have those mental stresses that are, are ongoing afterwards. And by talking through things and understanding as much as possible, they can then process events and, and it helps them kind of move forward and start to, um, to, to kind of aid that healing process in in moving forward with their life basically um taking the next steps going back to work if possible back to school um and yeah kind of kind of reintegrating basically that hopefully it will allow them to live as normal a life as possible similar to what it was before they had either their illness or their injury right brilliant so hopefully you said that hopefully I help a lot of people out the aftercare team and hopefully it's all the nurses and everything um yeah obviously uh they do a brilliant job of what they do hopefully you as you as a doctor um hopefully if something happens to the patient hopefully um do you allies with them do you or do we what sorry do you, do you allies with the nurses do we what do we, i didn't really get i didn't hear what you were saying do we allies with the nurses liaise with... yeah uh, yeah, so we have a really good relationship with our aftercare nurses. Um, like I was kind of saying earlier, every time we do a job, when we get back to base, we um, complete paperwork. Um, and that paperwork is everything that we've done with the patient, all of the medications we've given, all of the treatments we've done. And the um, aftercare team uh, gets sent a copy of that. But equally, we can always just email the aftercare team or phone them and say look actually I think this patient or this patient's family because it's not just the patients in themselves that are affected particularly if there's been incidents that have happened in the home that relatives have had to witness um, and they also need a lot of support so we absolutely liaise with our aftercare nurses to say actually you know could you quite quickly follow up this family even when maybe the patient is still in hospital could you make contact and touch base with the family to make sure they're fully supported as well um so yeah it is it is a close relationship that we all have together are you always in contact with the community of fundraisers because of flea there's a lot out there fundraising i didn't know if uh, so within uh, so it's, that's one of the great things about moving back to or kind of having helimed house is that everybody will hopefully be working um, under one roof. We're still obviously waiting for Boris to fully relax um, the, the lockdown restrictions at the moment. But as and when that happens, it means that we will be under that one roof. Our fundraising team will be um, in, the, in the office as well. So actually we can have that closer tie with them that we can get involved in in any kind of fundraising activities, which in the last year hasn't been the case because so many people have had to work from home and obviously so many fundraising events haven't been able to, to go ahead. But yeah, moving forward, absolutely, that's what we want to, uh, you know, to, yeah, to go forward with and fully integrate all together. I'm losing you a bit there, Nicola. Oh, sorry. Did you hear any of that or not? We lost you a little bit there. And um, so I was just saying about the fundraising team that um, it's one of the um, advantages of Helimed House in that as soon as uh, Boris lifts all of the COVID uh, restrictions, we'll all be under the same roof working together, which means we can work much more closely with the fundraising team um in the last year with covid a lot of people have been working from home so we haven't been able to have those relationships so moving forward absolutely hopefully working as a much tighter knit closer team together brilliant um hopefully i forgot to record the first bit 
later on. Yeah. So I'm just going to ask you again, uh, what's your job, yeah. in, job entailed? So uh, with AAA, so with the Air Ambulance, I'm um, a consultant, one of their doctors. Um, so my job entails working uh, with a critical care paramedic um, on shift and we ill or injured patients um, which we do either flying in the aircraft which I think is what everyone's more familiar with um, however aircraft can only learn and land in kind of certain spots so if it's um, closer to the base or if it's kind of in the centre of Norwich or Cambridge we also have a rapid response car so we'll then drive to the scene um, and we work with the ambulance service to um, treat those most unwell patients, provide whatever care um, they require, uh, whether that may be pain relief or whether it may be that they need an anaesthetic and we need to pop them off to sleep to then be able to take them to hospital for ongoing care, investigations and treatment. Brilliant. Um, after that, I was going to ask another question. Obviously, you can do... Uh, roadside surgery yeah um obviously a lot of people want to know obviously you can have surgery in hospital but obviously a yeah. lot of people may want to know what it's like to do it outside obviously to not not give a lot of graphic detail but obviously yeah, lot, a lot no, of people I, I won't give won't give too much graphic de detail if people are a bit squeamish but it, it it's basically um it's mainly in our trauma patients that they will sometimes have suffered such um, life-threatening injuries that there are some surgeries or interventions that can't wait until they get to hospital. Um, so it's we don't do them very often and they are quite high high stress procedures but um, yeah they're, they're, they're interventions that need to be um, done rapidly um, for things like people that have a collapsed lung say if they've got lots of rib fractures that it means that we can reinflate that lung, that thing, things like that. Um, yeah, I probably won't go into too much more graphic detail than that, but no. probably enough to say, yes, it is. It's quite stressful. Most of the time, these patients, we've already popped off to sleep, so they're not aware of anything that's happening. Um, and we only do those interventions that can't wait until they get to hospital um, where we let our surgical colleagues take over. Yeah, no, yeah. I thought I'd bring that, that, up to, that up to you because obviously a, yeah. lot of, a lot of people don't realise that usually a lot of people don't realise you can actually do that at the roadside. Yeah. Because if they yeah, an, a, an ambulance can't really do that, can they? Uh, no, so normal road ambulance paramedics, no, can't do it. It's a lot of years of subspecialty training and expertise that we learn. And as doctors, we learn in hospital and we go to theatre and we work with surgeons and then can bring those skills out of hospital to the roadside if needed. I've got another question here. Uh, has most of yep. the patients you've seen been in an accident or are they, or are they ill in some other way? Um, it's roughly a 50-50 split um, as to whether it's... Um, yeah, illnesses and whether that's heart or lung related or whether it's um, kind of stroke type symptoms and a, a brain injury or, like I said, um, horse riders. We do get a lot of working in Norfolk road traffic accidents or other accidents at work. It's, yeah, it's about a 50-50 split. Brilliant. Um, obviously, I was going to say another question then. Obviously, you deal with a lot of people. Uh, like accident wise and stuff um, do you also um, do a lot of things to help uh, people out because of really being a doctor you're quite medically trained um, so what's the most challenging thing you've ever dealt with most challenging jobs um, I'd say probably from an emotional point of view that you have added on um, jobs involving children uh, where you've then got relatives, you've got parents involved as well. Children aren't just mini adults. Uh, so from a kind of physiology and their kind of physical makeup, they're not they're not mini adults. They don't behave the same as adults. But you do have also the emotional stress uh, that it that it's just human nature that dealing with very unwell children is is potentially more difficult than than dealing with adults so i'd say any of those jobs whether it's 
medical problems or whether they've been injured some way, they're, they're definitely the tougher jobs to go to. Brilliant. Um, how did you end up becoming a helicopter doctor? Uh, so I, um, the, the same as all doctors, went through medical school. Once you've done that, kind of got become a doctor. Um, I you you can either as an emergency as a helicopter doctor, you can either specialise in emergency medicine, so that's working in A and E, or you can specialise in anaesthetics. So they are the doctors that pop people off to sleep um, so that surgeons can do operations. Um, each of us cross train and do a bit of both. So I'm trained in both. Um, and then you can apply basically to, um, further, for, to do further subspecialty training, um, in pre-hospital emergency medicine. So that's flying with a helicopter service. Um, and, and yeah, you go, you go from there basically. Has anyone in the uh, chat got any more questions before I let Nicola go? Cause I really, I understand you're going to be busy. That's all right. Has anyone else got any more questions? Just wait a few minutes and just see if anyone. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, it looks like we're going to have no more questions for you. Um, thanks for joining us. Yep. Uh, and obviously, no worries at all. Uh, thanks for what you do as well. And hopefully, keeping us all safe. Yeah, no worries at all. I hope that the rest of your event goes really well. Cheers, thank you very much. I've got a couple of hours to go, but I'll be all right. Yeah, doing really well so far. Yeah, I am. All right, then take care of yourself. All right, no worries, Casey. Bye. See you in a bit. Bye. Bye. So there we go. Uh, that was the uh, Dr. for the Eastern Air Ambulance, uh, obviously. Um, Going to stop that real quick.